We're going to cover uh, a number of complications after knee replacement, and particularly uh, loosening, stiffness, wound problems, uh, metal sensitivity, and aseptic loosening. So let's start off with uh, this first case, uh, and I think you've all seen these cases, but just to review this. This is a 67-year-old male who underwent a knee arthroplasty about seven years ago, and now has a recent onset of pain and swelling. Um, he denies any recent illness. Uh, he states that um, on examination, he's got a moderate effusion, slight warmth when compared to the contralateral knee and no tenderness. Pain is primarily increased with weight bearing. His laboratory studies demonstrate a normal white blood cell count of slightly reduced hemoglobin, a sed rate which is mildly elevated at 25. C-reactive protein is normal and his uric acid level is 6.2. So um, his uh, radiographs, uh, these are the, the potential five options. And um, the radiographs you can see here. And if you look closely at the radiograph, uh, you can see a uh, radiolucent area, particularly in the medial femoral condyle here. And you can see it in the lateral film here. Uh, otherwise, uh, the implant uh, appears fairly well fixed, uh, and there's no gross uh, change in implant position. So of the choices that are available, uh, the most likely uh, diagnosis here is osteolysis, as you can see from the x-ray, and that's the correct answer. Now, interestingly, about three-quarters of the respondents to this question said aseptic looseness, loosening. And it's important to realize that there is an overlap between osteolysis and aseptic loosening. Uh, if osteolysis becomes severe, implant uh, fixation is compromised and loosening, in fact, does occur. The other point I would make about this case is certainly, although it's an example of osteolysis and aseptic loosening, it's always important in this setting uh, to aspirate this knee and to rule out infection as a possible compounding problem. Just a little review about uh, aseptic loosening. Um, I think Dr. Parvizi in an earlier module has gone into some detail about this, but I'll just mention a few things. Um, it is a macrophage-induced inflammatory response uh, to wear debris, uh, which activates basically the osteoclast. And this particular debris and activation of the osteoclast will lead to osteolysis. Uh, which then, as I said earlier, can lead to prosthetic micro, right, micro motion and loosening. And then eventually with further particulate debris dissemination, not only in the local interface area, but other areas even more distant. And there's a, a more detailed explanation of that uh, listed elsewhere. Now, <clears throat> the pathophysiology uh, of of uh, osteolysis has a lot to do, of course, with wear of polyethylene. And there are many factors that have influenced wear in polyethylene. Uh, most dramatically was the sterilization method. Uh, this was particularly a problem in the PFC knee. Uh, about 25 years ago, there was massive osteolysis as that sterilization technique produced significant uh, damage to the polyethylene. Uh, the manufacturing technique, conventional versus cross-linked polyethylene, but important to, to know that convention polyethylene or compression molded polyethylene is still an outstanding surface in knee replacement. Third body debris will increase wear. Uh, back surface, uh, backside wear between the modular tibial insert and the metal tray will generate uh, polyethylene debris. Roughness of the femoral component uh, interface uh, surface, uh, not really seen in current uh, technology, which is quite good in terms of the surfaces, surface finish of our components. But if it's scratched with methyl methacrylate or bone fragments, that can increase the amount of wear that we see in a knee. Again, overall alignment and stability play a big role in both wear and loosening and subsequent osteolysis because of the asymmetric loads that are then transmitted across the tibial and femoral surfaces 
and this malalignment uh, will in fact lead to uh, potential loosening and increased wear. And then additionally, um, activity level, particularly active patients uh, who are, can be abusive uh, to their implants can accelerate wear and lead to osteolysis and, metal and uh, polyethylene debris. In terms of the symptoms, well, uh, the symptoms may be very little at the outset uh, with osteolysis. Um, you may just, it may, may just be a radiographic finding localized uh, in, the, uh, in small areas of bone around the implant and not necessarily uh, leading uh, to loosening. And you'll just uh, sometimes notice the osteolytic area uh, without ultimate uh, uh, loosening in, in the early going. Uh, again, aggravating factors would produce symptoms if, in fact, it goes on to produce aseptic loosening will be weight-bearing, particularly changing position from a seated to an upright position uh, will often increase uh, pain, and often it is activity-related. The more active the patient is, the more um, symptoms they, they generally will have. Um, <clears throat> imaging is important. Uh, I've always found uh, useful first, of course, to get uh, plain radiographs and an oblique x-ray uh, so that one can see um, further image, further uh, areas of the, uh, of the femoral and tibial component are helpful uh, when you look at just plain imaging. Uh, oftentimes, uh, the uh, osteolytic areas are in the posterior condylar surface and may be uh, ob obliterated by the uh, femoral and, and tibial components, so you can't see it. Overwhelmingly, I have found that imaging will definitively help in documenting osteolytic lesions. And this could be an MRI or a CT scan. Both, I think, are useful. These two radiographs that you see here on the right demonstrate where uh, plain imaging sometimes will miss um, the osteolytic area. You may not see it very well. Um, particularly here in the medial uh, tibial surface uh, beneath the uh, plateau here. If you look below it, you can see with imaging a more definitive osteolytic area with actually frank cortical uh, damage occurring, and the same thing in the lateral projection of the imaging. So plain x-rays are useful, uh, but imaging is going to be much more helpful as a rule in defining the extent and the localization of an osteolytic. Lesion. The treatment, uh, if you identify an osteolytic lesion uh, which is not particularly symptomatic and not in, in, impairing the fixation of the device, then certainly you can observe that patient and follow them uh, with serial x-rays on a 6 to 12 month basis. Uh, I have found, although um, documentation in the literature uh, is not readily available, but I, I use bisphosphonates uh, in the uh, early osteolytic uh, patient, um, and I found that oftentimes um, it appears, and this is anecdotal, to, uh, if not mitigate, at least um, stabilize the area of osteolysis. If um, loosening occurs, which is more uh, definitive with symptoms and pain, uh, and with, the, uh, with evidence of osteolysis, certainly revision, knee replacement is indicated. And the only other, only other caveat to that is that sometimes uh, on following your patients, you may see extensive areas of osteolysis with compromise of medullary and cortical bone. The patient may not be particularly symptomatic. But as you follow that patient, if the osteolysis is getting much more significant, probably better to intercede earlier before there is catastrophic bone loss rather than necessarily wait for symptoms of pain and loss of function to occur. If you enjoyed this video, please consider leaving a like. We'd love to hear your thoughts and what you'd like to see next in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and follow us on social media.